I'm continuing my introduction to Dante's Divine Comedy, and I want here to focus on the issue of Dante's exile, because his exile, political exile, is um, key to understanding this poem. It's written from the point of view of somebody who's away from their homeland, and the poem begins to explore what that means. Now, one reason we know that we're dealing with one of the greatest poems of all time, if not the greatest, is it is a poem that has um, drawn and inspired more commentary than any other work ever written, including the works of Milton and Shakespeare and Homer, any other work other than the Bible. Uh, Dante's Divine Comedy uh, has a tradition of commentary. And of course, there are commentaries on Milton, there are commentaries on Shakespeare, but we're talking about detailed line-by-line -line commentaries that go on, I mean, whole essays, articles, books, written on a single line of the Divine Comedy. And, and you can't think of any other work for which that has been done other than, other than the Christian Bible. The commentary tradition, interestingly, began uh, in Dante's own lifetime. In fact, almost when the ink was like dry on the Divine Comedy, the commentary, the commentators start moving in. They realize that there's a, this is a poem with so much there that the poem itself is a kind of tip of the iceberg. And one of the earliest commentators on Dante was his own son. And then, of course, other people took it up, and, uh, and that has continued. So one of the reasons we read this commentary is we, we get a much deeper understanding of the underlying landscape and also the profound resonances of this poem. Dante was one of the most learned men in Europe. And so even though the poem has a kind of beguiling um, uh, surface, uh, there's a lot underneath. There's a kind of whole leviathan, if you will, under the tip of the whale that you see poking out from the water. Now, um, Dante's exile is important because it allows Dante to reflect upon exile in all its meanings, a political exile, a spiritual exile. I mean, if you think about Dante's journey, his journey through hell and purgatory and to heaven, that's a kind of exile, right? It's an exile from life. Dante is, you may say, out of this world, and he's someplace else. But from Dante's point of view and from a spiritual point of view, you could almost say that the exile is the other way around. And what do I mean by that? Well, from the Christian point of view, we are exiles here and now in this world and in this life. So our real home is elsewhere. And our exile is this world. And Dante has this bigger... Um, and moral sense of exile in the back of his mind. But he's also thinking about political exile, and that's what I want to focus on, because I talked um, last time about um, the political factionalism that was going on in Dante's Florence, um, essentially a duel, if you will, between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. But, but the Guelphs and the Ghibellines were reflecting larger divisions in Europe uh, and in Italy. Divisions between, on the one hand, the Pope, the Guelphs were kind of the party of the Pope. And on the other side, the French king who became the Holy Roman Emperor. So the Ghibellines were the party of the Emperor. And, um, and this factionalism was going on in, um, in Dante's um, Italy. Now, what happens is if you're a Guelph or you're a Ghibelline in Italy, you're going to try to make allies not just with powers that are in the rest of Italy, uh, the Pope, the Holy Roman Emperor, but you're also going to try to make allies with people who are friendly to you from outside of Florence. And in a famous battle that occurred in 1260, called the Battle of Monteperti. This is, by the way, relevant to the Divine Comedy. Um, in this battle, the Ghibellines, who were kind of the minor party, the smaller party um, in Florence, allied with an external power, and that is the city-state uh, of Siena, against the Guelphs, against the army of Florence made up mainly of Guelphs. And the Ghibellines won. Uh, the Guelphs were defeated and in 1260, the Ghibellines became the rulers of Florence, and they remained that way for about six years. This is all relevant because five years later, um, Dante was born. So Dante was born when Florence was actually under Ghibelline 
ruled. And the Ghibellines, when Dante was one year old, were kicked out and the Guelphs came back in. So there's all this factionalism going on. And although Dante's poem is written for all time, it's written for the ages, Dante is very enmeshed in this. And he uses the factionalism to make larger points about the way that political struggle is conducted. I mean, this kind of factionalism, think about it. We have it in our own day. We have our own Guelphs and Ghibellines with different types of attachments, but also at each other's throats, as you know from listening to this podcast. So with the Guelphs having won in Florence when Dante was very little, uh, and in fact, the Guelphs stayed in power, one might think, okay, now there's going to be stability. One party is one straight out. So kind of Florence is going to be sort of a one party state. Well, interestingly enough, that doesn't happen. Interestingly, what happens is something like what happened with the Democratic Party in the 19th century when um, after Jefferson and after the Democratic Party became kind of the only party, the Federalist Party sort of went out of business. What happened to the Democratic Party? Well, it essentially split. Jefferson's old Democratic Republican Party splits and you have the Democrats and the Whigs. So similarly in Florence, what happens is that the Guelphs, believe it or not, who are now the ruling party, they split into two bitterly opposed camps, which are historians now called the Whites and the Blacks, the kind of the White Guelphs and the Black Guelphs. And the reason we call them white and black is because of their armbands, the insignia. They're just a way of distinguishing one group of Guelphs from the other. Now, Dante is, if you will, a white Guelph. But uh, at this time, this is now when Dante is coming into his um, 30s, uh, the late part uh, of the uh, 13th century, the 1290s, uh, what happens is that the um, Holy Roman Emperor at this point is kind of weak and the really powerful force in Italy is the papacy. And so both the Guelphs, the white Guelphs and the black Guelphs go to the Pope and they say, you back us. And of course, the Pope can only back one or the other. And for a variety of reasons, Pope Boniface VIII, the figure very important in the in the actually a figure that Dante puts right into hell. Dante does not hesitate to put popes into hell. But um, Boniface, um, his, his presence is felt throughout the, the comedy, but he's the pope. He decides to go uh, and back the Black Welfs. And the moment he does that, and in fact, remember, the pope's backing is not, I endorse the Black Welfs. No, the pope is going to send armies to expel the White Guelphs from Florence and Dante at that point is completely doomed. In fact, Dante is in Rome at the time. Once Boniface makes his decision, Dante is essentially an exile. He can't go back to Florence. In fact, he couldn't go back to Florence for the rest of his life. What does he do? He goes to Verona. Remember Verona? That's the site of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, he then moves to other places in Italy and he ends up in a place, kind of a little bit of a godforsaken place on the Adriatic Sea. It's called Ravenna and Dante dies there in Ravenna. And he's uh, buried there in a kind of out of the way place with a small sign, Dante, you know, and, and in Florence, they built a massive uh, monument to Dante and they were trying to get Dante's body from Ravenna to Florence. But the, but no, Dante, in fact, is in Ravenna. And so when you look at these two things, the, the great monument to Dante in Florence, that's kind of Dante at the height of his power. In fact, that's the date at which the Divine Comedy is set when Dante is an important figure in Florence. But then Dante, when he writes the poem, is an exile. He initially had tried to get back to Florence, but he never did. And so he is in Ravenna. He had begun the Divine Comedy earlier in Verona. He completes it really a little before his death uh, in Ravenna. And this concept of exile becomes central to the Divine Comedy in a way that I will explore tomorrow.